All right, good afternoon, um, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is our uh, first uh, kidney transplant family uh, education. So we appreciate uh, our families joining us uh, uh, during this education. It's very uh, informal. And like I said, this is our first one. So we're just gonna be running through some slides and kind of dealing with some technical difficulties at times. Um, we do find it easy on our end for presenters, just some housekeeping, um, putting your phones um, or, or the, the uh, virtual session on mute. If you can put yourself on mute, then that avoids a little bit of the background and we'll try to do our best here as well. Um, our presenters will introduce themselves as they come along in the presentation. Um, and you certainly can put questions in the chat. We'll monitor that um, as well as if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question um, or raise your hand. If you get fancy, there is that raising hand button there on uh, the meeting that you can certainly do that if you have a question. Uh, but pretty much you'll be meeting with our whole multidisciplinary team and we'll be discussing the steps um, on our kidney transplant evaluation, uh, what to do on the wait list, and then some of our post-transplant things that um, you need to be aware of. Uh, we are going to be recording this um, just for our records and then also just for some families who want to reference this. Um, again, it's not going to be super interactive. It's just going to be our faces and, and the slides, but it's certainly something that you can reference in the future. All right, with that being said, we'll get started and we'll start with uh, Dr. Varnell and just talking a little bit about our history of our program. Hi everybody, Chuck Varnell, one of the kidney transplant docs at Cincinnati Children's. So I'll kind of have a couple of things to share throughout the presentation today. So just kind of looking back historically around how long we've been in a kidney transplant program. We did our first kidney transplant in 1965. Um, those were all deceased donor transplants back at the time. Uh, we didn't had our first living donor transplant in 1987. And then through June of this year, we've done 834 kidney transplants. Um, and then our current transplant on an annual basis puts us kind of in the top five for pediatric transplant volume. Um, in the last 10 years at least, and then we have a 100% one-year graft in patient survival, which is something we're really proud of. And so uh, you're going to hear from many of the members on this large multidisciplinary care team today um, about the different ways that they're involved in the transplant process, and then um, a lot of these folks you'll meet later on part of the evaluation journey. Um, and I won't read through everybody here, but it takes a team to take care of a transplant patient and family. Great evaluation overview. Um, just a little bit of information about the kidney. Um, I don't know, Dr. Varnell, just do you want me to go through this or do you want to yeah, go through do it? it Jen. Go for it. Okay, so um, most of us, uh, we all have two kidneys. Um, they are about the size of our fists um, and they're located at the back. So I'm all, I'm a very visual person. So they're pretty much like back here. Um, and um, yeah, they're connected to the bladder. So what our kidney does is it makes urine. Um, it removes waste and extra fluid from our blood. It maintains our body's acid-base balance, just kind of regulating, making sure that that our um, we're not too um, acidotic or basic. It's it's just one of those things, and it helps. It's really important in blood pressure monitoring, bone health, and then also helping us uh, produce red blood cells. Um, so our kidneys, just a little, our kidneys, um, and these little ureters, um, those are those yellow things that you see. Those are attached to our bladder. So um, the kidneys filter the blood, and make urine or liquid gold, and then they go down into the bladder. Signs of chronic kidney disease. Um, so some folks that do need a kidney or kidney transplant um, have abnormal bone health and poor growth. Um, usually, typically, our, our kids, um, they feel normal until um, our kidney function is, until the kidney is not working really well. And these are some of the stages that we lay out for um, chronic kidney disease. Um, so stage one, you don't really see any decline um, that you can physically experience or your, your children won't be feeling much, much anything. Um, but then stage two, we start to see some 
um, ab abnormal labs mostly. Um, and then stage three, you start to see more of that. Um, and then kids may, may feel tired, um, not very hungry. Um, they may get an upset stomach um, and they may feel full without even eating. Um, you'll see that either they won't gain weight or they actually lose weight. Um, and you see a decrease in their concentration because, again, the kidneys are our filter. And so if we're not filtering um, the bad stuff out, um, then those things can really affect um, how we think on a day-to-day -day basis. In stage four, you'll see very abnormal blood work. And then stage five is basically the, kids, the kidneys are not working and you will require some assistance, either it being um, dialysis to help with the filtering of blood or you will need a transplant. Between stage four and five is really when we, tr we decide um, candidacy for a transplant. Um, this is also a little bit more, and you can reference this, this is our chronic kidney disease stages, and this gives us a little bit more of a description. And then our GFR, which is our glomerular filtration rate. So just how well our kidneys are filtering our blood. Um, and these are this is what we really look at to signify kind of how to how to quantify objectively what stage our patients are in uh, for chronic kidney disease. Any questions in the chat? Um, so our treatment options, so a lot of us on this call have had um, medical management so far, um, just managing it potentially depending what the cause is. Um, so medications and helping to sustain our kidney function as much as possible. Um, and then some of us who are stage four and then preparing kind of teetering to stage five is our option of dialysis. And so hemodialysis, essentially, um, folks who are on that are getting the uh, fistula in their arms or a graft, um, and that's when we connect to the dialysis unit um, that we, we, we use the fistula, and that's how we filter the blood. Some of us are doing peritoneal dialysis, where it is our dialysis catheter is in our stomach, and we're doing that overnight. And then the option that we're here today to discuss is kidney transplant. And this is our so, schematic here. So go ahead. Yeah, I put, the, I, I put this slide in basically to show that when you get to this point in the conversation, you're going to be thinking about what the next stages for your kidney disease are. And so those two treatments, as was just described, are either dialysis on one end of the spectrum um, and kidney transplant on the other side of the spectrum. We think of both of these as treatment modalities for end-stage kidney disease. So um, unfortunately, kidney transplant is not a cure, um, and it's not uh, a cure for dialysis, but it is um, an improvement in lots of reasons. And so it's this ongoing treatment, as we said here. Um, for this treatment to work, it requires taking uh, medications as prescribed. Um, and if you have any bladder issues, optimum bladder health. So if you have to catheterize um, or, or keep an empty bladder, um, those are going to be very important. So then, um... That's, that's our steps right now. So we're all deciding and discussing what kidney transplant evaluation looks like. So most of us have already um, been in this phase, which is step one, and it's the referral. So essentially you can be referred, you can refer yourself, families can refer their children. Um, most of our referrals do come from a nephrologist um, who our patients have been seeing. The nephrologist puts in the referral, our team um, then receives the referral and finance approves it for uh, evaluation just to make sure from a financial standpoint, folks are able to sustain um, and, and be able to, to manage transplant from a financial standpoint. Most of us have been through this phase. Step two, we're at the early part of step two, which is evaluation. And so part of that is really discussing kind of what what um, what this looks like and if this is a good treatment option for your kids. Um, we basically do this education session and then a lot of you will be seeing um, in next week uh, during our evaluation clinic. Um, we talk about your chronic kidney disease. You'll be seeing our, our transplant nephrologist, as well as that list of multidisciplinary team members. You'll be seeing our transplant surgeon, 
um, social work, financial counselor, you'll be getting a call from dietary, uh, psychologist, anesthesiologist, cardiology, all of that. We want to gather as much medical information as we can, and it depends. We've got criteria. It depends on your child's age and overall health. We'll decide on what um, special consults we will need um, in order to proceed with um, to decide if your son or daughter are a candidate for, for transplant. Once we get all those records, our coordinators and our medical team do look at all of those records um, and we put it into um, a presentation, um, for lack of a better word, um, and we present these cases and your kids in a multidisciplinary team fashion. So it's not one person deciding candidacy for transplant. And that means just seeing if your, your child is able to be placed on the wait list, but really it's a multidisciplinary team decision. Um, we review all of the testing that's done, um, all of the assessments from our consults um, being psychology, uh, cardiology, urology, all of those consults. And we, we discuss it in this type of format uh, where everybody um, uh, discusses when they saw the patient, what that looked like, and how successful they would be um, to proceed with uh, transplant. So it is a multidisciplinary team approach. This meeting, this multidisciplinary team meeting happens once a week um, and your coordinator will let you know when your child is coming up to be discussed. So typically when you see us in clinic, our goal is, and depending on the complexity of your child, our goal is to really present that to the committee within two weeks. So at the multidisciplinary team meeting is when we discuss as a team um, our recommendations for um, one, approval, meaning your child has met the criteria to proceed with a kidney transplant. Um, and at that point too, we our team decides on some recommendations based on your child's um, uh, medical complexity. Um, they do have choices of, uh, we could list them for a deceased donor and or a living donor. Most of us in most of our, our program, we do we do recommend living donation and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in slides to come. At times, our multidisciplinary team um, recommends that we defer the evaluation. And essentially all that means is that at this point in time, in the time that we presented your child, there were certain things that we were still not clear and that we needed to um, get further uh, either recommendations or further assessments from other subspecialties, um, just depending. So something might not have been completely clear and we had to, we had to do some more additional testing or further follow-up. Um, we do provide some sort of time frame with that. So typically, you know, um, maybe it could be a weight issue. Maybe your child has lost a significant amount of weight and we need them to get to a, another, um, we need them to gain about 20 pounds. And so we'll discuss what that plan looks like. Um, and then once they gain the 20 pounds, then we will represent your child to our multidisciplinary team to get them to see if, if, if that would then approve them for transplant. The third decision is decline. And so this is when we determine that, um, unfortunately, transplant would not be a suitable choice at this time due to barriers. Um, um, and so we basically would close that evaluation. Um, at certain time points, it, it just depends on, we rarely do this, but at certain time points, it may just depend that they might be a little bit too sick to proceed with transplant. And so we recommend that we close the referral, get them to get a little bit healthier, and then we can process another referral once that happens. So once we receive approval um, for transplant, our coordinator will call and we'll discuss the next steps on getting onto the wait list. Um, again, with being on the wait list, we do have to get financial approval, um, but you will be you will get a phone call and a letter stating that you your child is being activated on our wait list at Cincinnati Children's. So step two with the wait list is to solidify some travel arrangements. And usually this is already done beforehand and you are already aware. Um, our social workers do discuss um, 
kind of what the expectations are on how close you have to live um, to the hospital. Typically, we do say if you live greater than uh, six hours from the hospital, that we will help you with travel arrangements and, and we'll discuss what that means. It could be a flight, um, it could be anything, um, or we have to get notification a little bit sooner um, if you're coming in for a transplant. When we call you and saying that you are activated on our list, there are two also two different things that we could we could say you're active, um, your kid is active, and that means that they would be if any type of deceased donor organ comes into our area, your child could be could receive that organ. Um, and so they would be active on our wait list. Some folks going through this evaluation will um, they've been approved to be on our wait list, but we identify them as inactive because potentially we've got some living donors. They have some living donors that are willing to donate a kidney to them. So we will activate them on our wait list, but then we will classify them as inactive just because we are we are evaluating potential living donors or that we recommend that your child has a living donor. And so we are placing them on the on the wait list, but we are stating that they're inactive. Um, down below, you can see there are other um, other things that could potentially have um, potential reasons why we would make your child inactive. And that could be if you call us and you tell us that your child is not feeling well and they're hospitalized, um, we would potentially inactivate them on the wait list. If um, they lost insurance or we've been unable to contact them, um, those would be reasons that we would inactivate your child. Um, when we do inactivate your child, it does not mean that um, they they are not they're off the list. All it means is that they will not be accepting any active organ offers. So meaning we would not be able to transplant them if a donor came available. Um, patients still accrue wait time. So if we say that, say your child is hospitalized due to infection and cannot be activated on the list, we would inactivate them, but that um, they would still accumulate time on the wait list. Um, it would not affect where they are um, on the wait list. You would still be able to accumulate time. And that's a little difficult to understand. Um, and it's I'm having a hard time explaining it, but hopefully um, I did OK there. <laughs> Any questions in the chat? No, no. I would just say I don't it doesn't being active or inactive does not affect your wait time status. Just to say it in a different way, yeah. you're not coming off the list, you're staying on the list. It's just a period of time where you're not eligible for an offer. Good way of explaining it. OK, so then um, while you're on the wait list, um, what should you do while um, while you're on? Um, it's helping your kids um, getting into a routine of taking medicines um, on time and as directed, helping your child stay as healthy as possible, um, getting the recommended vaccines. Flu shot um, is an important one annual testing and follow up with the transplant team. So let's say your child is on our wait list and um, they have not been transplanted and they've been in, on the wait list for over a year. You will have to come back and, and do a more uh, truncated or shortened evaluation, but we do have to check on you on an annual basis. We do have to check on your child on an annual basis to update testing. And um, we will notify you when that happens, but it is we we do like to touch base with you guys with the patients on a on an annual basis. Important things to talk to your coordinator about um, would be if your child is hospitalized, had any recent infections, not feeling well, had blood transfusions, insurance, you changed your um, address, or you had some travel plans. Um, it's okay to travel and it's okay to go somewhere, but it's important just to let us know so we can devise a plan if an organ offer were to be um, would were to come up. So then we have risks versus benefits. And Dr. Varnell, I don't know if you want to take this on yeah. or 
So when we're trying to weigh the difference between um, what the right treatment for your end-stage kidney disease is, whether that's the route of dialysis or the route of kidney transplant, it's all the decision to approve or not approve somebody really relies on do the benefits of the surgery outweigh the risks of the surgery for any given patient. And that is really what drives approval um, and declines in some instances. So we can switch forward. So what are the benefits to having a kidney transplant? So one of them is if we look at the data, um, it's pretty clear. If you look at the blue line, this is looking at how many years of life we expect someone on dialysis to have. The red line is somebody with a transplant and the green is somebody who doesn't have any kidney disease. And you can see the move from someone on dialysis for as in-stage kidney disease to someone who has a transplant is about 30 more years of life expectancy, which is an awesome addition. Um, we're not quite at the level of the general population, but these are things that we're hoping to uh, tackle throughout more research in the future. So the second one is, I don't expect you guys to be able to read this or understand it, but there is data where we've asked patients on dialysis and we've asked them after they've had a kidney transplant, what's your quality of life like? What's your fatigue like? What's your um, ability to deal with your daily responsibilities? And the both the patients and the caregivers of the patients report um, a better quality of life with a kidney transplant compared to being on dialysis. And then the third bullet point is this isn't as important to most patients and families directly, but if you think from like a government or a healthcare system standpoint, it is way cheaper actually to maintain a functioning transplant than it is to maintain somebody on dialysis by almost a factor of 10, at least in the first year. Um, so for those three reasons, more life, better life, cheaper to take care of, the goal really is to move people um, as best we can from this end-stage kidney disease on dialysis more towards kidney transplant and even moving upstream with preemptive transplants. And that's just our way of saying before you get onto dialysis. And so those are the benefits. They're really clear and those are pretty easy for most people to understand. So now this is where we go through some of the risks of the transplant. So this one I'll uh, let Dr. Bondock talk about. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Bondock. I'm the surgical director of kidney transplant here at Cincinnati Children's. Um, so I just wanted to give you kind of a general overview. Um, for this month, I probably won't be meeting any of you guys next week or the 18th, whichever day it is. It'll be a couple of my partners. So just from a logistical standpoint, just to give you a sense of how this works is I have three other partners. And in conjunction with Dr. Varnell and Dr. Hooper from the kidney side, I take um, <clears throat> we take my partners and I take kidney call at a week at a time. And so as I think Chuck had let you know, the vast majority of patients uh, in this country, uh, children included, are transplanted with what's called a deceased donor organ offer, as Jen had kind of explained the process to you. Um, but there is a substantial amount of uh, patients, including at our program, where about 50% of patients are transplanted with a living donor kidney. And that is done for a couple of reasons. The main reason being that um, the, all the medical data would suggest that a living donor kidney option um, has a be, has better long term outcomes, longer long term outcomes. But unfortunately, that is not always an option. And as Chuck, as Dr. Varnell just explained to you, the better option is, in our opinion, and the the information would suggest the outcomes would do, suggest that dialysis is always the getting free from dialysis is always the the best option. The gold standard renal kit renal replacement therapy is to actually replace the kidney. But of course, that requires a major operation. And I know that some of you, including some people I know on this call very, very well, have already undergone very substantial surgery. But Suffice it to say that kidney transplantation is a major operation. As you see from the slide, it can last anywhere from four to eight hours. Um, usually it lasts a little bit longer. Um, for the younger children who have substantial bladder problems, uh, because we oftentimes will collaborate with the urology uh, service in the reconstruction of the, uh, of the urinary tract. And really, um, what it boils down to is from a just a purely surgical standpoint to make it as simple as possible, and this is what I tell all my families, is that I have to make three new connections. I have to make a new artery connection that will bring blood into the kidney, the new kidney. 
I have to make a vein connection that will drain blood out of the kidney. And then we have to make a, a ureter connection that will allow urine to come out of the kidney and be collected in the bladder. Um, and so in order to prepare for that, as you saw on the previous slide, um, some things have to happen. And they all happen typically after the patient goes to sleep. And so a patient, in order to go to sleep, a patient needs to be intubated by an anesthesiologist, which means a breathing tube is placed um, so that we can control the bleeding. Oftentimes we will place a central line, which is a special IV that goes into the large veins of the neck or the upper chest. The reason why we do that is to monitor the pressure inside the heart to make sure that the patient has enough fluid on board. Uh, we also use it to give patients medication, fluids, etc. Uh, we have to monitor the patient, um, their heart rate and their blood pressure, um, as well as place a catheter in the bladder because it will be very important to monitor urine output of the kidney, hopefully immediately after surgery. Okay, Jen, you can go ahead. And so this is the typical setup for the incision. Um, this is called a Gibson incision, and this is an incision that goes in the sort of on the bottom side of the right side of the patient's body. And the reason why we do that is we don't like to go into the belly if we can avoid it, because we don't want to put anything at risk like the, or, the um, abdominal organs. So actually, if you make this incision, you're able to free the peritoneum, which some of you are aware of, because that's how we do dialysis in a good number of our patients. But what is the peritoneum is actually just a bag. It's almost like a plastic grocery bag that contains all of your guts inside of your abdomen. But the nice thing about that bag is if you push it away, it contains all the abdominal organs and it exposes two of the major blood vessels that go to the right leg. And that's where we're gonna make those new connections. Because when I receive a donor kidney, the first things I'll do is, besides getting the kidney ready, is we'll sew in the artery, again, that takes blood into the kidney, and then the vein that drains blood out of the kidney. And my partners and I do this under magnification. We use very fine suture that is finer than fishing wire. So in that way, you can release the clamps and allow the blood to go, the donor, the recipient's blood to go through the kidney, the new kidney, um, to filter out all that waste and start making urine. And in some cases, especially in living donor surgery, the kidney may, may, may start making urine almost immediately. We just did one today and it, that was how it was. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, of course, unfortunately, putting these blood vessels together is not like splicing pipes at the house. It's living, breathing tissue, so sometimes you can have it too narrow, which can cause blood clots, which can cause um, uh, impairment of flow, which can be damaging to a new kidney. Or it can be too loose, but that's easy oftentimes to figure out because then if it's too loose, you'll see bleeding, which we fix immediately. The last part of the transplant surgery is then reconnecting the ureter or the muscle tube that collects urine from the kidney into the patient's bladder so that all that urine can be evacuated and come out just like normal. So I think you can go to the next slide. And this kind of just goes into a little more detail than what I had just said and shows you a picture view of it. Um, so once we do the blood vessels again, we will then reconnect the new ureter of that transplanted kidney, which you see in this in the bigger panel into the patient, into um, the body. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And so this is a little more detail about that from time to time, because again, sometimes when you're sewing these the the urinary tract back together, if we if the bladder is which is a big muscle and it acts as, you know, um, uh, a storage area for urine until you pee all that new urine out or pee urine out. Sometimes if the bladder muscle hasn't been worked out, just like, you know, working out at the gym, it gets weak and it gets smaller. So, so from time to time, we'll put a plastic tube called a stent in through that new connection to promote it to, for it to heal. Because similarly with the blood vessels, it can either heal too loose which would cause urine to accumulate outside of the bladder, which is fortunately very rare, or it can heal too tightly. And that can cause a narrowing, which can back up urine, which we don't want either because that can also injure the new, the, um, the new kidney. 
And then the last piece of it is we close the uh, incision. We have to close the muscle wall over the space and all those stitch and then we close the skin all those sutures are in the inside on the inside the next big step is to wake up the patient from anesthesia where the first stop will be the icu where we get the first thing we do even before the patient's fully awake is get an ultrasound to make sure that the blood flow in those new blood vessels is appropriate because if god forbid there were anything wrong we would go right back to the operating room to fix that in the meanwhile, myself or one of the other my partners, sometimes in conjunction with Dr. Varnell and his team, will come out and update the family, your family, and tell you how everything went, what this, what to expect going forward, and then sort of send you over to the ICU so that once we get the patient all situated, under warm blankets, the IV lines organized. We're going to um, have you guys be back with the with the patient and be with the patient until um, transfer to the floor and discharge. And then the, I think the last piece of this was um, depending on how old the, the recipient is, um, oftentimes I would say it's an average of two to three nights in the ICU. Older um, patients are typically there. They may only even be there one night, but younger children, infants even, oftentimes can be there four or five days until that kidney stops making so much urine it's hard to keep up with. And then after surgery, um, again, age dependent, but oftentimes a patient will um, stay on the on uh, our recovery floor, A4 North, for perhaps five, seven days. Um, again, maybe longer for the young, the the younger patients, and this is where really a lot of the important learning occurs. We're making sure that the immunosuppressive medications in the blood, the levels of those medications in the blood, is appropriate. We're also teaching you about the, these new medications you're going to have to be on. We're teaching you about scenarios that may come up in regular everyday life, where you know if 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 X happens, then we do this, or if why happens then i'm calling trisha or if something if you know somebody's sick at home all these different scenarios we're trying to work our way through because um we want you guys to feel as comfortable as possible and i know that's saying a lot or asking you guys a lot but you're going to become pros at dealing with all these new situations after the transplant and then the last piece of my part is why do we have to go to the icu well, all kind, all manner of things can happen, as you might imagine, after such a major surgery, because we're giving you all kinds of medicine. We're giving the recipient all kinds of medications to suppress their immune system. We're giving them all kinds of fluids and, and medicines in the OR, um, especially in the younger kids. You now have this big adult's kidney sitting in a little tiny body that doesn't necessarily have the same amount of blood, uh, blood volume to fill uh, an adult's kidney as well. And so all these different things can happen because, again, remember, this isn't just like replacing a carburetor in your car. There's a big lead up of, you know, the patient's been sick, like Jen was telling you, um, and they may not know it, but their bodies know it. And so once you change these things very significantly, you can have all kinds of different responses. The body can have all kinds of different responses to the process, all these different complications, and it's easier for us to deal with them in the ICU when it's typically one nurse for one patient, one nurse for two patients because of the uh, of the acuity of patients in this scenario. I always like to add here that I, I tell people to expect that there's about 100 possible things that could go wrong after a kidney transplant program. And one of the reasons we like to have people come here is we do a lot of kidney transplants. We can expect everyone's going to run into some sort of complication, hopefully a minor complication. But regardless of what it is, you know, the team is ready and prepared to very quickly react to it and in real time fix whatever we think the problem is. The ICU is the best place to do that. So Dr. Bondock just talked about the major surgery and kind of the recovery piece, but there's some other, you know, since we're talking about risks of the transplant, other things we need to think about. So I included these pictures. These are actually from a book um, from part of the Improving Renal Outcomes Collaborative. I put the, the website address down in the bottom right. If you guys are interested in checking this out later, there's a nice patient education section. They created this book, um, obviously geared towards younger children on what is kidney rejection, but it helps to, to explain the point that, um, 
from the moment that you take somebody else's kidney and put it into a different person's body, your immune system is going to recognize that's not supposed to be there and it's going to attack it. And the goal is to destroy this thing because our immune systems aren't smart enough to know, oh, I need this to live. It just knows, hey, this isn't me, I'm not supposed to be here. So um, I think I put a couple pages from this book here. I can't remember which ones they are at the top of my head, though. <laughs> so, um, so specifically, the immunosuppressive drugs that we're going to give you are going to turn down your immune system. Generally, you're going to be on two to three medications you'll take by mouth every day to lower your immune system. Um, what's nice about these drugs is they do turn your immune system down. I try to tell people it kind of tries to make your immune system tired. It doesn't destroy it. It doesn't make it go away. So what happens when you go in the world? You're still going to get sick. You're going to go to the supermarket. You're going to go to school. You're going to live your life. You'll still be able to fight off these infections. You just won't be able to fight them off maybe as normally as you would not on these medications. And if you do happen to get sick or you get an infection, a urine infection, a pneumonia, you are more likely to get more sick than you would without the immunosuppressive medicine. So what's the important takeaway point from this? Um, one, you will still get sick like everybody else does. Two, the majority of the time, you'll fight it off by yourself, just like you normally do, like a virus or a cold. And three, we need to know about fevers. So if you're having symptoms at home, you're not feeling good, that's a call to your transplant coordinator to let them know, hey, here's the situation. And they can help you work through, okay, is this a see my primary care doctor kind of sickness? Do I need to come to the ER sort of sickness? And based on how far you are post-transplant, this will help us figure out what to do next. I don't remember, you can keep going through some of these slides. I don't remember what my talking points were here. So, but most importantly, the way that we stem off your immune system from attacking your body is taking the medication. So we, we work a lot on this within our clinic from any age, so from children all the way up to the young adults we care for by asking you questions about taking your medication. How are your meds? What side effects do you have? Um, do you not like the taste? You know, we'll ask you if there are things that get in the way of taking your medication because we realize this is probably the single most important thing that the patients and families can do for the life of the kidney. Um, there's another version of this book because um, I know not everyone on this call is a child. Um, there's an adult version as well that's written for the parents um, that goes through and kind of more grown up language like why do we worry about rejection? How can we prevent it? Things like that. Um, so we mostly talked about the infection risk side effect. You know, to me, the most important part is good communication based on how you're feeling. Um, and then just a special note on some particular infections, um, just like with a blood transfusion, um, taking an organ from another person uh, always will come with some risk of spreading an infection. Um, the donors that are giving kidneys, whether they're living or deceased, are extensively tested. Uh, for infections that we wouldn't want to transmit from the donor to the recipient. Uh, the technology at detecting these infections is very, very good, even up to somebody who's been infected within the last week or so for a lot of these diseases, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. Usually the window where we can't detect it is within about five days prior to testing, but outside of that, I'm very good at detecting these things. And so uh, all that is just to say uh, the recipient and the donors will be tested for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, regardless of the risk of the donor. So if you see these testing show up in your chart, I don't want you to think, oh, we're getting some kind of different kidney that's at higher risk. This is just standard practice throughout transplant. The other thing the immune system does that people think about less often than infections is that it's actually one of the first lines of defense against cancers. So if you think about all the cells in our body are dividing to stay alive, so you have one cell, it's got to split into two, that cell has to copy its DNA and the instructions on how to work over into the new cell. And if you're doing this over and over, occasionally uh, your DNA will make a mistake in how it copies those instructions. And a lot of those mistakes are where cancers come from. So a cell doesn't know it's supposed to die a certain way or it's supposed to go over here and act that way. And so your immune system can recognize when this happens. We actually develop cancer cells within our bodies probably more than we'd like to think. And your immune system just takes care of it. It sees it's not supposed to be there and it kills it. When you're on immunosuppression, there are two types of cancer in particular that you're at increased risk for compared to the general non-immunosuppressed population. The first one is skin cancer. And this is the same skin cancer that everybody knows about. It's um, why you try to avoid sunburns. Uh, if you don't have a lot of hair, you want to make sure you want to wear hats so you're covering up skin. You want to avoid uh, too much tanning. Um, the same thing goes after transplant. We would recommend avoiding uh, sunburn and sun damage to the best of your ability. 
Um, once you're over 18, we recommend you see a dermatologist every year to do a full body check looking for um, early skin cancers. What's nice about skin cancer is a dermatologist can very easily early identify these lesions and just cut them off in the clinic. And for most cases, that's it. You're done. It's taken care of. The problem with skin cancers are if you wait a decade or so, you know, it's been 10 years and these things are festering. By the time they've caused you symptoms, there's not really much you can do from an intervention standpoint. The second cancer I like to talk about is a blood cancer. Um, it's a type of lymphoma or a lymphoma-like disease. The long name for it is the post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. The abbreviation is PTLD. It's a type of blood cancer uh, that occurs in kidney transplant patients. Probably 1% to 2% of our patients per year develop this. The good news about this type of lymphoma is that it's always been treatable um, in our experience. So we've never had a patient or a graft loss to post-transplant lymphoma within our kidney transplant program. Um, usually the way that we treat this uh, initially is by reducing some of the immunosuppression. Uh, a lot of this is associated with a virus called the Epstein-Barr virus. And by reducing your immunosuppression in many patients, that's sufficient for treatment. If you need a little bit more treatment, there's some IV medications that can help get rid of certain cell lines in your body that are uh, also very effective treatments for this. Very uh, rarely, so not common for most people who develop PTLD, but occasionally it can be an aggressive enough lesion that you do need to receive traditional chemotherapy. Um, so you would be on the oncology service, but that is the exception um, and not the rule. So how do we monitor for infections, for um, cancers and things like that? Well, part of it is how often we see you in clinic and how often we're checking uh, labs. So you'll be coming initially post-transplant to the clinic uh, two times a week. We hold clinic every Monday and Thursday um, in the mornings from eight to 12. And so we'll be following with a clinic visit, a full physical exam and blood work twice a week. And then we start to taper that over time, um, one, based on the risk factors of the patient, and two, how far post-transplant you are. So we'll start at twice a week, go to once a week, and continue weaning that until after about the first year of transplant, we get to every other or every three months or so. Uh, we continue during this time following uh, blood work just about every month. Again, keep an eye on these complications, look at kidney function, look at electrolytes, none of the stuff that you can feel happening inside your body. Um, occasionally, um, if there's either a complication from the kidney transplant, uh, we may want to get a piece of tissue with a kidney biopsy. So this is just a picture of what a native kidney biopsy looks like if it's done on your back, but it would be the same thing just with the patient with their belly sticking up. We can use an ultrasound probe and look at the kidney on ultrasound and use a biopsy needle under ultrasound uh, to take a piece of tissue from the kidney. So the kidney doctors um, are routinely doing the kidney biopsies. Um, occasionally, we'll need help if it's a complicated patient from either interventional radiology or from one of our surgical colleagues. Um, we do these uh, whenever we need to evaluate potentially for rejection. So if you have abnormal kidney function, um, there's no blood test or urine test that's going to tell us right now if you're rejecting your, your kidney or not. We have to do it with a biopsy. We are also um, doing surveillance biopsies in our patient population. A surveillance biopsy means checking on the kidney before there's a problem. And we found that about six months after transplant is a good time to do that. Um, and so we go and take a piece of tissue. This helps, helps us identify what's called subclinical rejection and gives us a chance to change our immunosuppression that we're doing prior to developing a problem that's actually affecting the kidney. So what does life after kidney transplant look like? Um, largely, it's just thinking about how immunosuppressed you are and how likely you are to get sick in any given um, situation. So the first three months, we really want to minimize, for the first six weeks especially, we want to minimize any crowd exposure, supermarkets, going to school, kind of have you stay home for that period. After that, it's just being cognizant of the situations you're going to be around, making sure we're keeping up to date with our immunizations. Um, particularly the flu shot is a big one, um, both pre and post transplant that we really like to emphasize for keeping you healthy. Um, the flu especially is one of those that people don't think about as being so bad as we, you know, get it quite often during the year, but it's still uh, one of the biggest viruses that does kill otherwise healthy, normal people every single year. And in this hospital, um, that's even uh, increased risk if you're immunosuppressed. We already talked about avoiding sun exposure. Um, thinking about travel arrangements, um, you're allowed to still live your life, go on vacation, just making sure we have a plan for uh, how much medicine do I need? What am I going to do if I get sick? Who am I going to call? Um, 
Certainly, uh, dental health is very important, but we try to give people a heads up. We want any major dental work to be done prior to transplant or not before six months after transplant. So that's why dental clearance is involved as part of this. Um, certainly, the emotional adjustment of life with a kidney transplant. There's a lot of um, adjustments that are made, and a lot of people have a hard time afterwards. And so we're uh, obviously screening for uh, making sure that everyone's mental health is in a good spot um, after transplant. And then we tell people they can usually go back to school around six weeks after transplant. So uh, Dr. Bondock talked about this briefly, so we can probably go through it pretty quickly, but where do transplanted kidneys come from? Um, there are two different pools, either deceased donors or living donors. Uh, as Dr. Bondock said, the living donor advantage is several fold. Um, one, if you identify a living donor and they're approved to be a living donor, this is a scheduled scenario. So you have a date and a time to show up to the hospital, go to the OR. Um, and when you look at the average expectancy of the life of that organ, you can expect somewhere around 15 to 20 years for probably living donor kidneys. The C donor kidneys, on the other hand, for example, you don't have a living donor. Um, these transplants happen when they happen. So those of us that take a kidney call, the nephrologists and the surgeons, um, we just get a text anytime, day or night, that, hey, we've got a kidney for you. So you may get a phone call from us at two in the morning. Hey, I need you to wake up. We've got a good kidney. Come on into the hospital and kind of work through things, which is totally fine and we love to do it. Um, but it is a, you have to be ready at all time. We need to know your travel plans. Um, and then the kidneys don't necessarily last as long. So somewhere in the eight to 15 year range. Um, but that's still a lot better than dialysis. We have to match it ac across a bunch of different factors um, and size and things like that. And all that affects your waitlist time. Um, and we have to make sure it's a blood compatible match as well. Um, there are rarely some specific factors in pediatrics that we need to talk about uh, that we would need to consent you for prior to a deceased donor transplant. So for most of our transplant patients who aren't difficult to match, um, we don't have to worry about donors with increased risks, but there are scenarios where a patient, it may be hard to find a kidney for. And so we may need to think, okay, if I'm not getting a kidney in a certain amount of time, should we consider taking kidneys from donors with increased risk behaviors? Um, this slide is just to remind me to tell you guys that if we are ever accepting an organ from somebody who has an increased risk for infections or transmitting infections, we do disclose that to you. We actually can get your consent that it's okay. So you would know what that increased risk behavior is or that there's an increased risk. Um, and you know, you guys have a voice here if it's something you wanna proceed with or not based on the risk of that donor. discharging home. Um, so prior, so you received the transplant, um, and as mentioned before, you're, you can anticipate hospital time being anywhere between, most likely looking at about seven days. Um, prior to that, each transplant team member will meet with you um, and your child to go over the care plan and expectations. And again, reiterating a lot of the information that we've just discussed. Um, one to two days prior to discharge, um, those involved and those that have been um, brought up indicating that they will participate in, in the patient's care, um, whether it's a family member or a friend, um, they will be required to take over the child's care while they're in the hospital. Um, this ensures that you um, that the caregivers are getting used to kind of the new medications that are being added um, to the patient's medication regime and ensuring that they understand some of the side effects, the expectations of when to take the medicine and how to care for the transplant. So again, going over some of those signs and symptoms of infection, um, being a fever, uh, not feeling well, um, those signs are very similar to rejection. So being able to, to identify what those are uh, will work with um, the patient and uh, caregivers uh, while they're in the hospital. And this is just a way to kind of mimic what's going to happen at home to, to best suit you guys being ready um, to take your child home after transplant. Um, the purpose of the transitional care is to make sure that we're giving you a reasonable plan as well. Um, a lot of patients go home on um, feeds 
by a feeding tube. Um, they may need additional water. Um, some of the patients that have urology involvement will um, require catheterization. So making sure that the medication regimen um, and the feed regimen and the cath regimen aligns in a way that we're not going to make it impossible um, for you to manage at home. So not only is this a way for the families to get used to the new care regimen at home, but also a way for you to communicate with the care team that this is reasonable or unreasonable. So part of being a transplant center um, and part for some of the education is for the families to understand uh, what we're being held to as a transplant program. And not only are we advocates for patients to get transplanted, but also assuring that we are having good survival rates. And as we discussed earlier on in the presentation, we have 100% graft survival rate um, at one year, which is, which is a big deal. And so we are being monitored um, for our patients that we transplant within 90 days, uh, one year after transplant, and then also up to three years. So um, making sure that um, our patients are living a long, healthy life. Um, and so one place that you can check um, on our uh, uh, what our outcomes look like and how well our patients are doing, you can visit the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. Um, the short is SRTR. And those basically... Um, for folks who are statisticians out there, they they basically outline what is um, what transplants we have done, um, how well they have done, um, and what we're expected to hit. So again, these slides are just to to you can look at other transplant centers and see where we rank. Um, but again, you want to look at um, how many transplants we do a year, which is typically between twenty to thirty kidney transplants, um, and then um, our survival, which again, one hundred percent survival after one year. And that's what these slides are. So moving along, um, we will talk about our transplant medications. Just waiting for our pharmacist. Okay, we will circle back maybe. He's here. LD. LD Sorry, sounds like it looks like she's talking, but we can't hear uh, her. It's it says I'm unmuted. We can hear oh, you. Now. Here we go. Oh my goodness gracious! You. There we go. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm LD. I'm one of the two pharmacists that works with the kidney transplant team. Um, when we think about medications post transplant, there's kind of three big buckets of medicines that you'll be on after a transplant, medicines that help prevent rejection. These are gonna be your friends for life, medicines that help prevent infection. And then we kind of have this other extra bucket. And go to the next slide. So the first group we'll talk about are immunosuppressants. Really the goal of these is to help keep the immune system sleepy so that they don't attack or reject that new and foreign kidney. Like I mentioned, these are gonna be your friends for life. Right after transplant, our patients are going to be on three medications, usually tacrolimus mycophenolate and then some type of steroid like prednisone or prednisolone after transplant. The tacro and the mycophenolate are usually the big two that are, are you're going to be on for life. If you have a bad reaction to one of those, then something else will likely take its place. You can go to the next slide. This is just an example of those immunosuppressants on a medicine list. We can keep moving. So some really important notes about these medications. It's very important to be consistent with the timing that you take them or you give them and if they're given with or without food. So when I say timing wise, if you normally take your medicines around 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. every day, the goal is to try to get it in between, I'd say 8.30 and 9.30 every day. Kind of stick within that time slot. Food is important because food can impact how much of the medicine gets absorbed. So if you always like to take your meds on an empty stomach, try to do that and be consistent. If you're always taking them with a snack or a meal, try to do that and be consistent. Um, labs and particularly checking the amount of this medication that's in your blood will kind of be a part of your regimen forever after a kidney transplant. It will eventually get spaced out to about once a month, but we're always gonna wanna check in and get labs. I wanted to highlight medicine interactions, mostly because other medicines can impact how much of your immunosuppressants stay in your body or 
how quickly your body is able to get rid of those medicines or, or hold on to them. So anytime a new medicine is started or stopped, the transplant team is always going to want to know about it because we might might have to pick a different medicine that doesn't interact with your immunosuppression. And I'll say before you go home from the hospital, we'll talk to you about all the common and kind of major side effects to look out for. All right. Um, as kind of Dr. Vernal alluded to earlier, a lot of the medicines that we give you have some side effects. Um, I'll say while we kind of have our standards that we do for all patients, we realize that everybody is different and it's going to be a balancing act that's specific for you. We don't want to overdo it with our immunosuppression medications where you're having too many infections or, or too many side effects. And we definitely don't want to underdo it um, and see rejection. So we will cater the immunosuppression regimen to you to make sure we find the right balance. All right. The next bucket of medicines are our ones that we use to prevent infections. So usually you're going to be on three medicines after transplant, something to help prevent bacterial infections, fungal infections, and viral infections. For most people, these are only on for three months after transplant. That's just an example. We can go on to the next bucket. These are just kind of that other group. So these are medicines that maybe you're on before transplant and we still just have to continue because of some other underlying diagnosis, whether it's ADHD or asthma, we're gonna have to continue those medicines and stay on those. The other kind of group of other is sometimes we see side effects from our immunosuppression medicines. So these could be things like high blood pressure or maybe a magnesium or a phosphorus supplement. So as long as these are needed, they'll be on board. And this is just an example of some of those that we use. I think All that's right. it for me. Any questions in the chat? Nothing. Okay, moving right along. Hi everyone, my name is Nessa and I am one of the kidney transplant social workers. There are two of us, so some of you may meet my counterpart, April Fong, through the transplant journey. The role of social work in the evaluation process is to support patients and their families uh, throughout the entire transplant journey from the initial evaluation to post-transplant care. Uh, recognizing that each person's background and situation is unique, um, we will engage with you more deeply during our designated time together to understand how we can best prepare and support you. So today I'm just gonna share some general resources that should be uh, mostly re relevant for everyone here. Starting with the Ronald McDonald House, they offer local accommodations for families who live more than 40 miles away from the hospital. You can stay here while your child is inpatient or even after discharge if you have two or more appointments each week. Um, please note that there's typically about a week long wait for accommodations and you can also self refer by visiting their website, which is listed here. We are also very fortunate to have the Family Resource Center available to us. If you visited the main campus, you may have noticed it. It is located between buildings A and B. Uh, they offer support with discounted hotel rates. Um, they also provide a space for families if you need to work remotely. They have access to a computer lab with printing and scanning and Wi-Fi. They also just offer snacks and beverages. So their goal is really just to make your stay as convenient and comfortable as possible. Here you'll find some resources for nonprofit medical fundraising. These organizations support families with fundraising efforts and provide one on one assistance in engaging your community to do that. Importantly, these donations are tax deductible as the campaign requires medical verification. So that is how it can be different than if you're thinking about something like GoFundMe, which you might be more familiar with. To get started, you can visit their website, which is also listed here. I also want to highlight the Make-A-Wish program. You can self-refer on their website, and when you provide your doctor's information, they'll send us uh, any necessary verification forms. Um, but again, you can self-refer by going on there. And that is about all I have for you today. I look forward to meeting some of you in person next week, um, and please feel free to bring any questions you might have then. Transplant nutrition. 
Okay, hi everyone. Um, you can probably hear me on Jen's computer, but I have my video on. Um, I'm Brennan, one of the dietitians who work with nephrology. There are three of us, um, and we'll just go over some brief nutrition information that's important with a transplant. Um, topics we cover during our portion of the eval are how steroids may impact nutrition, food safety guidelines, um, fluid intake, and how that may look currently versus post transplant, and any need for oral nutrition supplements or tube feeds. Um, with nutrition and nutrition and steroids, like um, some other members of our team have mentioned, um, we are going to monitor your electrolytes, and we will make any adjustments that are needed there. Um, steroids may cause water retention, which we can work with also. Um, and then we will uh, watch appetites because those may increase and we can look at some um, methods that we can use for just making sure you're getting the appropriate nutrition you need. Um, with food safety guidelines, um, main things, you'll get this handout and you'll have it uh, to refer back to, um, but just making sure that the food you consume is safe and appropriate for you um, since you are on immunosuppressing drugs. So no rare steaks, no sushi, things like that. Um, and uh, the big thing with this is always washing hands, um, but we can go into more detail with that and you'll have that um, as a reference after your transplant. Uh, fluid intake is a big, uh, a big goal we're looking at after transplant. Before transplant, a lot of the times we can be restricting fluid, and then after transplant, it's going to be the opposite. We are really encouraging appropriate fluid intake. Um, helps keep the kidney moving along. Helps keep that urine, um, urine going like it should be. Uh, so you'll have a fluid goal, and that's important to meet, but you can go above and beyond that as much as you want. Um, so we will just work on um, kind of a timeline for your fluid throughout the day. Um, if you're drinking that, if it's going through a G2 with some of our patients, we'll just make sure that you have the schedule you need to get your fluids in. Any oral nutrition supplements? Um, so these could be taken by mouth. These could also go through a tube. Um, just making sure that our weight is appropriate and our nutrition status is appropriate so that you can heal and just uh, keep living well after your transplant. And then with tube feedings, we will manage those. Um, we can look at electrolytes if we need to, but really post-transplant, uh, we have a lot more freedom with the formulas that we can use. Uh, so we'll make any adjustments with tube feeding products um, and fluid that we need to after transplant. Uh, these are the, some, some of the handouts that will go home with you after your evaluation. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah. Finance, I'm not sure if Nancy's still on. Yes, oh. I'm here. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Hi, everyone. I am Nancy Schwarm. I am one of the transplant financial, financial coordinators. There are two of us. Um, the transplant piece for financial, uh, the transplant is very expensive. Um, and we want to want to help you minimize any burdens that you might have with transplant. Um, we will uh, follow you through the whole process from the time we get your referral and ev even after your transplant. Um, we are to, we will be here to help you with any billing issues or um, insurance questions that you might have. Um, we will obtain all the authorizations for throughout the whole process. Um, and it's also very important to make sure to notify us if there are any changes. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, we, uh, there, like I said, there are two of us and we are split by alphabet. Uh, I am M through Z and Kelly is A through L. And we don't want you to hesitate to reach out to us ever. Um, you can always reach out to us throughout the whole process for any issues you might have. Chat. We'll move along to living donation. Hello, everyone. My name is Tina Stanley. I am the living donor coordinator coordinator here at Cincinnati Children's. Um, it was mentioned a little bit earlier by Dr. Varnell and Dr. Bondock. They touched on it a little bit. 
but I will meet with all of the families who come in with their children for a new evaluation and discuss that living donation is an option here at Cincinnati Children's. Ultimately, it will be up to the physician and the surgeon as to whether or not your child is a candidate for living donation. Um, I give you, I go over what's involved. I talk to you about how to find a living donor. And then any living donor that does come through the system, um, I will screen them and evaluate them and try to get them to surgery with your child. So um, they talked earlier in the presentation about the living donation team. This slide here just reiterates that. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is that anytime we're working with living donors, the two teams are kept completely separate. This avoids any conflict of interest. So your team and your child's team will work with your child to get them ready for transplant, get them put on the waiting list for a deceased donor. My team works strictly with the living donors. So if you, for example, call me and say, hey, Tina, my neighbor said she was going to call to get tested. Did she call? I cannot tell you that. I can tell you we've had three people to call, but I can't tell you who those people are. Their information is protected by patient privacy laws just like anyone else. So please be patient. Those donors can tell you as much as they want to about the process, but I'm not allowed to share those specifics with you. Um, this was mentioned earlier as well as far as the differences and how long we expect the different organs to last. So the living donor is the preferred option if it is an option. It also decreases the waiting time for your child right away. Not only is your child transplanted quicker, it's more convenient, and it also frees up a deceased organ for another child that might not have a living donor. Next slide. Um, anyone can be a living donor. A lot of times you guys come through and think that it has to be a blood relative. That's not the case. It can be a family member. It can be a friend. It can be a neighbor. I talk to you when I meet with you about how to go about finding, you know, we talk, you know, if you're part of a church group, talk to, talk to your pastor, your priest, or your organization at church. If you are in a school group or a mom's group or any kind of club outside of work, we talk about all different ways to find a living donor because, again, it does not need to be a blood relative. A lot of our patients use social media. Everyone uses social media nowadays and it's completely free. You would be amazed at how many um, referrals we get from donors that see one of these kids stories out on social media. And oftentimes they go on to be the, that match that is the donor in the end. So it does not need to be a blood relative. One thing I can tell you, sometimes the criteria depend on the particular donor. Uh, but one thing that's not going to change is they do have to be at least 18 years old. They have to be old enough to make that informed consent. Um, the evaluation for the donors is oftentimes just as lengthy, if not more so, than with what your kids go through. Because on the donor team, it's our job to protect that donor at all cost. We don't want to put a healthy person into a surgery that they will have no medical benefit from to have them come out worse than they went in. So it's our job to ensure their safety. So we're going to evaluate their um, kidney function at it as it is today and kind of predict the future. Let's say we've got a 35-year-old donor. If they donate a kidney, where they're going to lose about 20% of their kidney function. And then we all naturally lose kidney function as we get older. So we have to kind of predict how that's going to trend and make sure that we're going to not put them at risk for problems themselves in the future. So a lot of times it takes several donors to get tested before we find the one that's medically approved. For that reason, exactly, we have to protect the donors. So when I meet with the families, you know, for some people, it's an awkward conversation. How do you approach somebody about being an organ donor for your child? Um, for some people, it's perfectly fine. They've got no problems asking. Um, but it's easiest to start with your circle of influence, your family and close friends. They probably know what's going on already anyway, so that's an easy conversation for you to have. You take the information back, tell them what's involved, how they start getting tested. And then if they can go to their circle of influence, you continue to get that ripple effect if everyone takes that information out. Um, I talked about social media. And get creative. You've all seen yard signs, window stickers, bumper stickers. I talked about churches, posting in stores. I always tell people if you live somewhere or work somewhere that has an elevator, 
if you put one sign in that elevator, how many people are you going to reach in one single day just by one sign in an elevator? So get creative. Um, I also, too, when I meet with you, I give you social media examples because sometimes you don't know, well, what do I put out on social media? What do I say? What do I tell them? What's too much? What's not enough? So we do go over some examples with that as well to help you get started. This I already talked about. I jumped ahead of my screen. Sorry, I'm used to just talking and not reading off of uh, a prompt here. So oftentimes, too, people will come to me and they say, well, my donor doesn't, they don't work, they don't have insurance, so they won't, they're afraid to come get tested. So everything related to the medical evaluation, the surgery itself, the hospital to stay, the follow-up, it's all covered through the recipient's insurance or the program. So there's, there's no out of cost out-of-pocket costs for any of the medical piece for the living donors. Now, sometimes they might incur some expenses with travel and lodging, um, maybe, you know, lost wages. They do have their own social worker, just like your kids do. Um, it's the living donor advocate, so she is strictly working with the donors. And when they come through and meet with her, she will discuss the financial aspect with them. There are different resources that we can apply to that can oftentimes help our donors with reimbursement for those things that are not covered under the medical evaluation. First thing that somebody, if you know somebody that's interested in being considered as a donor for your, for your children, there is a questionnaire online. You can see that there it's highlighted in yellow. You go to this link, fill out the questionnaire. It comes to me electronically. I will review that with the surgeons. Once that's reviewed, I'll reach out. Hey, we're going to go ahead and test you to see if you're a match or sorry, because of this reason, you're not a candidate. As far as testing for compatibility, it's simple nowadays. We just send them a cheek swab. They can do it sitting on their couch. They send it back to our lab. Usually by the time when we get the specimen back in the lab, those results usually take a couple weeks, and I do reach out to everybody that sends a swab back to let them know whether they're a match or not. Once we determine who is a match for your child, then we would start with the full medical evaluation, um, and that's something that we go over in detail with the donors, you know, as they come forward. But first step, if you've got someone that's interested, is to ask them to go to that link to fill out the questionnaire. And then you also see my contact information down here at the bottom. Feel free to give me a call if you have any questions. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. All right. So that concludes um, our transplant evaluation education. Uh, what questions uh, do you have? And maybe we don't have any questions at this point. Um, you will be meeting again with our team uh, next week. This group will be next week. Um, and certainly you can reach out to us as well uh, if you have other questions um, or things that you might think of. All right. Well, thank you for your time and um, hope you found this useful. And we'll see you guys soon. Thank you.